on. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam wa rasulihi al nabihil kareem. So, last week we had kind of brushed over the, a certain word, tajreed. And I kind of overlooked it because I thought maybe there's no need to go deep into it. So I read it more detail and I thought, you know what, let's not, let's not overlook it, let's actually go through it. So the discussion was about should you adopt asbab and the means? So this is very like high level for the extremely, those who are extremely involved in worship and their lives are fully dedicated to worship. So for those people, is it still good to adopt the means? or let go of the means and live a life based on tawakkul fully. So here the author explains that you trying to reach the level of tajreed, which means to let go of things. So you intending to reach that stage, while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you in a different stage, which is, which is a stage of adopting the means. Mm -hmm then that is your spiritual desire, like a shahwat, mm -hmm. to reach that stage where you haven't reached that stage. Okay. So, and then he says the opposite also. Mm -hmm. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has intended for you to leave the world of asbab, mm -hmm. then for you to stick to it is you degrading yourself from a higher mm -hmm. level that you have already mm -hmm. reached. So you're, de you're downgrading yourself. Mm -hmm. So... So adopting the means or not adopting the means. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's actually very important muscle, especially when it comes to understanding a person's spiritual life. And I remember when I had to give a reminder in the markaz, tablighi markaz, I went deep into this because for some reason, our some of our tablighi brothers, they have a very like a misguided understanding of adopting the means. So in the bayan, they'll mention a lot of miracles. And there's a saying, do rakat say, like you pray two rakat and it's done. You don't have to do anything. But if you look at all the prophets, they were never allowed to, generally speaking, they were never allowed to leave asbab. You, you look at the story of Musa as a baby. And it's a perfect day to talk about Musa a.s. So as a baby, he was a, he was the mother was told, let go of the baby in the water. She could have just put him in a heavy box and just put him in there in a metal box. But no, she put him in a wooden box. Why? Because you're not allowed to go against the means. Wood floats. Mm -hmm. Metal doesn't. Mm -hmm. So she put him in a wooden box. And uh, other, other examples, yes, when he, at the final stage of his confrontation with Fir'aun, mm -hmm. when they reached the sea, he was told to hit the sea. And we know hitting in the sea doesn't really do much. It just splashes the water. But he was not allowed to let go of the means. Although a miracle is happened and an, uh, is about to happen, and a miracle is a time where asbab are completely out the window. Mm -hmm. So basically, Nabi, the Prophet Musa salam, always adopted means, and now finally, when it's time for uh, Allah subhanahu wa they call in English divine intervention. When divine intervention is coming, even then he's told, no, you stick to the old system, which is you have to shake a leg, shake a hand, do something, then only are we gonna give you miracles. So he's told to hit the water. So it's almost as if never are we encouraged to let go of means. Although this discussion today com completely goes against what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the Quranic examples, you're basically almost never told to let go of means. The only means I think he's talking about here is the means of earning. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to job, mm -hmm. should you let go of job ever? Mm -hmm. So that's what the discussion is. As otherwise, not general cause and effect. Because cause and effect are never supposed to be mm -hmm. overlooked. And now we look at Maryam alayhi mm -hmm. She has a child. She's told mm -hmm. to shake the date palm tree that's close to her. And no man, no 10 men can shake a tree. But she's been told to touch the tree, then the dates will come and you can eat that and you'll feel better. Mm -hmm. Ayyub alayhi salam, same thing. Mm -hmm. He's mm, he was extremely sick and finally he said, Oh Lord, like give me healing. 
Anni masanya dhurru wa anta arhamur rahimin. And then he's told, uh, move your foot in the ground and that would give you water. So he's not going to dig a well with the back of his foot. He's sick. He doesn't even have muscle power. But he's told, move your foot a little and the water will come to you. So absolutely no room for even the prophets to let go of Asbab. Mm -hmm. When the same thing with Nabi Sallallahu life, when we look at Khandaq in the battle of the trench, he was told he consulted Sahaba, they dug a trench, and in one of the battles he wore double armors. Mm -hmm. Double armors. So so yaqeen, yaqeen is very, very important, and that is a sign somebody has Iman. So Yaqeen and Tawakkul are some of the highest traits of a believer. If a person has Iman, he has to trust Allah that Allah SWT will help him, but he's not allowed to let go of the news. Mm -hmm. And that's why when Shaykh was explaining tawakkul and tawakul, with the alif in there, mm -hmm. but with the extra alif, which mm -hmm. is to pretend to do tawakkul. One is tawakkul in mm -hmm. Arabic, one is tawakkul, when you pretend to do mm -hmm. tawakkul. So he says tawakkul and tawakkul are two different things. Pretending to trust Allah and not doing anything because you're feeling lazy, that's not tawakkul. So he says, example, somebody who's not going to job. He goes, no, inshallah, Allah will take care of it, but he just sleeps in every day. But mm -hmm. if you're sleeping in every day, that's not tawakkul, that's tawakkul. Mm -hmm. So many times the examples that are given in the bayan, they're almost like hinting that just ask for a miracle. Mm -hmm. Don't go the, the long route, just take the shortcut. Just ask for a miracle. Yeah. So it really confuses people. So yeah, in general senses, never are we encouraged to let go of asbab al zahiriya the outward cause and effect. So he says there's three types of the jarrud, like letting go. One is outward, one is inward, and one is both. When you let go of inward and outward attempts and then he explains somebody who tries to adopt this lifestyle too early then he's lying he's faking his status so he mentions imagine a metal that's coated with gold plated the, in reality is different it's a different metal but you gold plated it so that's how um, this, this the Sufi or the whatever word that you want to use for the overly spiritual people but sometimes they have a very bad reputation when it comes to Muslim lands. You go there and that's a, you know that guy is gonna walk by your street at a certain time in the day and you have to give him some food. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. And there's another word for them, malang. Mm -hmm. They'll have some type of weird wooden instruments, they'll make some type of music. Mm -hmm. So it's basically extreme destruction mm -hmm. of the path of spirituality. The mm -hmm. path of spirituality is you go adopt your means do your work, mm -hmm. you don't have to beg the world. Mm -hmm. Just because you started paying more namaz doesn't mean I have to take care of your financial life. Sure. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. So basically, some people who are lazy, they just mm -hmm. put on very old clothing, start worshiping more because they don't want to go to work anymore, so now they're pious, now you got to take care of them forever. Yeah. It's almost as if it's like an EI, an employment insurance. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> put on an old turban, now he has EI. Yeah. So you got to take care of them forever. So that's how sometimes being outwardly like fakely religious and then showing poverty and wearing old clothes is indirectly begging that's why i remember my sheikh when i went once and, and he was in his dars he mentioned oh unfortunately i'm wearing old footwear although i have brand new footwear but this one is really comfortable so i'm wearing this one so please don't get the image that i'm wearing something old i'm really well to do i don't need nothing i don't need you to go buy me a new pair of shoes mm -hmm. i like these old shoes or these old sandals and I'm not wearing them to show that I'm poor. Yeah. So that's why we always have to, and that's why even in Tabligh they say you never ask directly, don't ask uh, even by the way you mm -hmm. do things. And then he mentioned sometimes the nafs is so lazy, it, it wants to reach the level of tajrid because it's so much easier on the nafs. You don't have to go to work anymore. You don't have to wake up at a certain time. The alarm doesn't <laughs> ring in the morning. <laughs> you have to wake up for exactly. a valid rate. Yeah. And you don't have to wake up for work. And work is a big mujahada, honestly speaking. Like going for hours and hours of work, yeah. especially for those who have to commute or have hard physical labor or mentally tiring yeah. jobs. Sure. It's a big mujahada. 
So sometimes pretending to be pious and then getting away with work is basically laziness. And the nafs enjoys it because you don't have any stress now. So now he mentions a very interesting story that one pious person who, ha who was a scholarly person who was teaching in a madrasa. So how that is perceived in the Tazkiyah world <coughs> is that a person who's teaching outward knowledges like Nahm or Saraf Tafsir, they say that's very special, but if you haven't reached a really good rank spiritually, then you're kind of wasting your time because you haven't got to the depth of the subject that you're teaching. So for example, you're teaching an ayat in the Quran that talks about tawakkul, but you, you don't feel it. So you might know all the words and you know all the tafsirs related to the ayat, but you don't feel it. So that's why they'll say, why don't you spend time in worship and spend time exercising spiritually so you can feel that, and then you can teach it to a higher degree. So this person felt like, okay, so I'm kind of wasting time with outward knowledges, and teaching it in a madrasa, so let me go to my sheikh and ask him. So by the time he came to sheikh, sheikh had hardly had a sense that he was going to ask that question. So without him asking, the sheikh explained that sometimes people like to let go of outward teachings because they feel like it's a good time to get deeper into the knowledge. But remember, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed you in a, se in a setting where you are being asked to teach mm -hmm. outward knowledges, although you don't feel those knowledges, mm -hmm the highest degree then that is your tajrid you know how you're letting go of things he goes that is your tajrid the fact that you don't leave it because Allah wants you to stay in that field and help so for you to leave it would be going against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mm -hmm. uh, demands from you So he says, so the sheikh told him that no, as long uh, you continue serving, and the same thing happens, uh, the same thing is the case with any spiritual person, let's just say there's an imam, he just doesn't want to teach in the masjid, he's like, oh, there's so much distraction, so much politics in the masjid, I don't want to teach anymore, I don't want to serve the masjid anymore. Mm -hmm. So outwardly, he might be leaving dunya, but in reality, when he mixes with the world, that's what the world learns from him. So if he starts hiding, and does a lot of worship, but he doesn't serve doesn't mix with the community, mm -hmm. the community suffers. So. so for him to teach the highest form of Islam, he has to stick to the basics, which, which is come to a mosque and take a salary. It actually like mentions taking salary and sticking to the outward. Otherwise, many times the books mention, oh, how can you take money for a job when you're teaching Islam? Mm -hmm. But that's the only way to get that guy to come to the mosque. Because he knows one, two things about Islam, and if he keeps mm -hmm. hiding in his house, mm -hmm then we don't benefit. And it kind of gives me a, a reminder of a Sahabi. He would stay away from general masses. So sometime he would walk by, and I think there was another Sahabi or a Tabi'i, he would kind of bother him and say, please, just slow down a little. Give us some benefit. Kalimatun tanfa'una wa la tadurruk, or something like, please say a word that will benefit us and it won't harm you. So just say one thing, and then he did that with him for a few t few days in a row. He would walk by and he'll say, hey, can you stop? Just tell us a few words of benefit. Mm -hmm. It'll benefit us and it won't harm you. Mm -hmm. So that's where seeking a sp a spiritual, like the people that can help us is really important. So if, you, if, if I'm lacking in Quran understanding, I go to somebody for Quran. If I'm lacking my tajweed, go to somebody for tajweed. If somebody, mm -hmm. if you want to hear something else, then you go look for that knowledge. In fact, this comes under even the marriage masail, can a lady go out of the house without the permission of the husband? So the mm -hmm. masala is, if she's seeking knowledge without which she doesn't know how to be a good Muslim, she doesn't even have to ask permission. Mm -hmm. And same thing for the first son who wants to go and learn Islam, but the parents are not allowing him, but mm -hmm. it's basic Islam, then in that case, he doesn't even have to ask permission from his parents. He can just go because it's the basic foundation of his religion. How is he going to wait for other humans to tell him how to live his uh, spiritual life with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
they go into the masala of <clears throat> like وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ So that idea when you intend something and go out and achieve it, have you broken destiny or have you reinvented destiny? So he says, no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had destined that for you. So by you intending something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has also intended it for you. So you're not changing destiny by making new intentions. Many times people ask, am I changing destiny? So you're not changing destiny. That's why even when Sahaba anhum were overcome by a situation sort of like COVID where mm -hmm. people were dying from a plague. Mm -hmm. And it's a very famous story, right? A Sahabi objected to Umar anhu and said, hey, are you running? Are you running away from the plague? So he said, uh, we're running from one destiny to another destiny. Mm -hmm. So giving the idea that regardless of what you choose in life, whether a person reaches that stage where he lets go of some outward earning and so on, but at the end of the day, he's still within the scope of the means. So yes? like, is it the idea that the destiny itself is, everything is predefined, or the idea is that something or things are predefined and something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala left us on, on our goodwill? On how we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, that's what it is. That sounds better. The second. Yeah. There's one hadith that gives it away in three different ways. It says uh, being kind to family ties will increase your risk, it will increase your life. Mm -hmm. So, what does that show you? Mm -hmm. That your destiny is changing depending on how good you are to your family okay. ties. Then the hadith continues with two more. I think it mentions dua. Like uh, nothing can change destiny except du'a. So now okay. du'a again is a worship, and it's changing your destiny. Okay. And the other thing was, I think, kindness towards parents can increase your rizq. So basically the whole hadith is three examples of ch uh, destiny changing depending on what step you take. Mm -hmm. So, and there's another uh, hadith that mentions a uh, person is sometimes deprived of rizq that was written for him mm -hmm. because of a sin that he committed. So it looks like many times we're left with an A and a B option in life. Mm -hmm. So that whatever we take, that will affect the outcome of our lives. Mm -hmm. But again, destiny is a very slippery slope. Once you go there, you get really confusing. And this next topic is over planning for life. So he mentions Arih nafsaka min at tadbir. Free yourself from over planning. Whatever someone else has taken responsibility for you, that you don't need to stand up and achieve that. So, whatever has been already planned for you, you don't need to stand up and plan it again. Allah SWT has already planned it for you. So, this is a very important, and I think this is where many people are depressed about their financial standing, financial life, and career uh, choices. And one of the dilemmas of people is the extreme amount of choices they have. So in the past, people were maybe depressed because of lack, mm -hmm. having less. Now we are stressed because we have too much and we don't know what to pick. Mm -hmm. So you go to buy shoes, you'll be lost for hours because you don't know which one to grab. You go to buy a bicycle, socks, you're just lost for hours because you don't know what to grab. You look at apples, you're like Googling blue up, green versus yellow versus gala versus these apples, which one is the healthiest? Because you have too much choice. Mm -hmm. You have way too much choice, and that's why it gets confusing. You go stand in front of tomatoes, you got four types of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these are basic childish examples, but you come to cars, you're asking the same. So homes, marriage, all these things. We have way too much sometimes, and it gets confusing. So it leads to almost like, what do they call it? Information paralysis or analysis, analysis paralysis. Analysis paralysis. Where there's so much information to take in, you just mm -hmm. become helpless. Like you don't know what to do. And that's why there's people that go to shop for something. They'll spend hours and their mind completely like goes into overdrive and then just fail and they make that decision. I'm not going to buy it today Yeah. because my brain is gone and it's just gone. Yeah. Yeah. And imagine if that happens too many times in your life. Yeah. So you're going to be very behind. So that's where over planning, although some planning is compulsory, right? It's, it's very important. A person needs to be well thought out. And we are not supposed to jump into things without thinking. Mm -hmm. 
but over planning and over writing out your future, it's just too much. So that's what the idea here is that do not uh, plan or free yourself from planning because who the Lord that has taken the responsibility of something, then you don't need to stand up for that same cause. You can leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Extentiated creation and apportioned out its lifespans and livelihoods. SubhanAllah, it's very connected to what we just put down, right? So Allah has given them life and He has uh, planned out their sustenance. He knew all that mankind and jinn would do before creating the universe. He commanded them to obey Him and He prohibited them from disobeying Him. All that exists runs its course based on His divine will and power. So Mashiach and Qudra, he safeguards and protects whomsoever he wills out of his divine grace. So read that again. He safeguards and protects whomsoever he wills out of his divine grace. And he diverts <coughs> and forsakes whomsoever he wills out of his divine justice. So some people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not overprotect them or overly protect them. And uh, outwardly, a person might think, oh, how is he being forsaken? For example, there's two guys that went to same high school. One guy being, ended up being pious. One guy ended up being doing very sinful things about his life after that. So what happened? So depending on the decisions the servant was taking, one was asking to be protected and one was asking to be neglected. So the one that gets accepted and protected that is also the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the person that gets neglected and doesn't get over that overly protected life, then that is also justice because the person lived his life like that. <coughs> and the Quran is very clear on that. That's, uh, uh, so like these kuffar, they, because of what they did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lead them further astray. Lead them further astray because of what they were decision, the decisions they were making. Mm -hmm. So... Otherwise, this is a concept that really messes up some people's minds who are mm -hmm. on the border of trying to become religious, mm -hmm. but they're not able to make sense of it. It really messes their minds. Mm -hmm. So no one may object to his judgment, and no one may overrule his decision. Good and evil are both predestined for his servants. Their actions are his creation, yet their own acquisition. So the actions that we do, they're also the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, walking is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once you do it, did you create walking or did you replicate it? So you replicated walking, you didn't create it. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the amal that you do, that is also the khalq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the kasab is yours, the acquisition is yours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not burden them with more than they can bear, and now it says the opposite, yet they cannot bear more than what he has burdened them with. Allah did not burden them, la yukallifullahu nafsan illa usaha. So Allah did not burden them with more than what they can bear, yet they cannot bear more than what he has burdened them with. This, in turn, is the explanation of the well-known phrase la hawla wa la quwwata illa lillahi al-'ali al-'azim. So there's no power nor might except through Allah, the sublime, the great. <coughs> that is to say, no one has any strategy, strength, or movement away from disobeying Him, except by His divine succor 
and no one has the power or ability to uphold his obedience and to maintain steadfast therein except by tawfiq granted by him. So basically this is a very very important topic like just as uh, severely we deny any other deity besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we say la ilaha illallah yes. that's how powerfully we're supposed to deny our ability to do good so la hawla wa la quwwata it's that strong there's a la in there right at the beginning like no there is no power there is no strength and once a person really like internalizes this then it can really help a person not get takabur otherwise we do one two things then the takabur is like 10 times more do two rakats but the pride is 10 rakat number <laughs> 10 rakat right like it's just like it's so it's like what's that thing the mortgage i mean interest that's multiplied faster and faster what do you call compound it interest. compound interest is compound takabur <laughs> honestly compound takabur i pray two rakat namaz but i'm walking around and say i prayed 100 rakats that's why one of our teachers, he did something beautiful. He would say, Al-Badiyu, Al-Badawiyu, Ida raka'a raka'atayn, yadadhiru al-wahid. That a Bedouin, when he prays two rakat salat, he waits around for a revelation. He's like, that's how badly mistaken they are. Like, oh, I spent three minutes, five minutes in ibadat. Something is up. <laughs> like, something is going to happen, bro. Like, I spent five minutes in extra namaz. Now you're looking around like, hmm. Or I feel it, I feel it, I feel it. <laughs> so that's why, if you remember, like when we read yeah. letting go of the d seven or six different valleys, one was the valley of unnecessary imaginations. So when a person finally internalizes and hopefully internalizes how there's no power to do good and to, to avoid evil, then it makes spirituality so much more easier to do. Otherwise, it's a really big struggle. You pray. You humble yourself for 10 minutes, now your brain says, oh, so you're humble, mashallah. You thought about humbleness for 10 minutes, you're like, oh, my foot's really big, oh, mashallah. Now you're something. And you said you're nothing, so you must be something. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens, right? For 10 minutes, you tell yourself, no, I'm nothing, I'm dirty. I'm so dirty, I'm full of nothing, it's all Allah's mercy. After 10 minutes, you're like, it's done, bro, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a wali, I'm a wali now. So it's like a, it's like you're fooling yourself sort of thing, right? Because you're telling yourself... Is it yourself, a waspata or what? No, it's the inability to understand that you, whatever you're doing is not mm. you. Okay. It's the inability to comprehend that whatever we are doing, it's, it's a blessing. Mm -hmm. It's a big time blessing that you're doing what you're doing. Kullun muyassarun lima khuliqala. Everybody, Sahaba were really confused about Jannah and Taqdeer. So they said, Prophet of Allah, uh, are we doing actions for a cause that has been decided mm -hmm. or for a cause that still has to be decided? Mm -hmm. So he said, no, you are doing something, a worship for, for a cause that has been decided already. Like you, if you're doing Jannati stuff, it's because you are Jannati. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing Jahannami stuff, that's already been decided that you're Jahannami. So basically, like you, it's already decided. Like the, the hadith mentions, Rufi'atil Aqlam, wa Jaffat Suhuf, the pen has been lifted and the ink has dried. So that's why Sahaba were thinking, like, are we Jahannamis already? Or Jannamis? Like, how does it work? So he said, you'll do whatever you're made for. You'll do what you're made for. Kullun muyassarun. Muyassar means asan. Like, so you, everyone will be assisted in whatever he's been made for. So we need to always like remind ourselves that I'm doing things because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has just, uh, assisted me in this. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's help, I would never be able to do this. And that's why the ayat comes in very emphatically. Like if it wasn't for Allah's fazl mm -hmm. and Allah's raham, nobody would ever become pious ever. Mm -hmm. Nobody would ever become pious. So it's making it very emphatically like clear. Like doesn't matter how much namaz you do. And how much worship you do, you will not become pious unless if Allah doesn't give you that extra, let's call it like extra ingredient. If the extra ingredient, extra blessing doesn't come, we're gonna worship more and more and become more wretched. Because or takabur parega, or takabur parega, or more takabur will come in. So, so.
so all matters take place according to the divine knowledge will power and decision the divine will then has overcome all wills and the divine decision has surmounted all strategies he does whatever he wills yet he never oppresses any one whatsoever so he does whatever he wills but it does not lead to zulm upon anyone he is transcendent above every evil or harm exalted above every defect or blemish <clears throat> and the ayat that he quotes here la yus alu amma yafal he's not asked about what he does but they will be asked about what they do so a person cannot counter question allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say but how come you destined this for me the person would have to answer of why he did what he did He possesses everything, yet nothing incapacitates him. Nothing can be independent, free from needing him for even a blink of an eye. So basically, one is khalq, one is uh, qiyam of that khalq. As humans, we have gotten used to the idea of things is existing. But we don't realize if you know how like the outer space works, things are constantly going through extreme changes. How come there's, ex there's a subtext? There's a sense of like sameness to our life. We wake up every morning, we know the birds are going to be chirping. We don't ever wake up and say the birds are all, all disappear somehow. Every night you hear crickets making that sound. So what's that normality? That is Qayyum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly making things exist the way He made them. So creating is one, but subsisting and making them exist forever or for the long time, for the time that he wants them to, that is the t part that we missed out on. Mm -hmm. So the way he made us, for example, you are what you are right now, but do you know how many changes go through your body when you go to sleep? Like if you had to just summarize how many things happen just during your sleep, it'll be like 10, 15, 20 pages of information of what happened to your body. So your eyes did this, your brains did this, your brain, your if you were hurt somewhere, the muscles repaired this, this, this way this many blood cells died, this many millions of blood cells were remade, the damage that you did by stomping hard on the stairs in your house or jumping from a high place, the amount of, my, what do you call it, like micro, micro fractures that happen in your bones, mm -hmm. they all had to be undone, isn't it? Like all, mm -hmm. the, all the hairs that fell, all the hair that grew, all the nails that grew, all those things. Mm -hmm. So that is Qayyum, mm -hmm. the one who makes these things happen and even our brains they're constantly deleting unnecessary information and, and saving important information uh, whoever then deems himself free from needing Allah for even a moment has become kafir whoever for a moment sees himself not needing Allah for even a moment has been disbelieved has become kafir Let's read the footnote on that. And by the way, this book has absolutely amazing footnotes. All of creation is in utter need of Allah, who constantly maintains their existence, while true independence and freedom from need is a divine attribute belonging yes. only to Allah. Sure. Right? Only to Allah. Hence, if the servant ascribes such an attribute to himself, he ascribes to himself a divine attribute and has indeed and has in turn disbelieved. So basically thinking that I don't need it, I don't need any special help right now. Mm -hmm. So that would be kufr. So may Allah save us, and I think the main thing in this case would be for us to mm, envision this all the time. Like I'm in need, I'm in need, I'm in need of iman, I'm in need of further guidance. Zadahum huda, the Quran talks about increase them in guidance. few more minutes then we'll stop the ability the istita'a by which an action must occur such as divine enablement tawfiq to obey which cannot be ascribed to any creature it occurs with that action the ability that refers to health capacity readiness and sound limbs however precedes the action so here this goes very deep into tawfiq so tawfiq is two stages the tawfiq that we call tawfiq is actually the higher level the lower level tawfiq for which we will be asked about is the what he mentioned 
the soundness of limbs. So having health, capacity, readiness, and the soundness of limbs, all that is a tawfiq for which Allah SWT can ask us. So for example, if somebody is missing salat or not fasting in Ramadan, so now he won't be told, did you feel the guidance every Sahri time to keep that fast? No, because that's something that we don't see. The main thing is, were you physically able to fast? Yes, you were. Did you fast? No, you didn't. You have to answer for that then. So tawfiq that we talk about, Allah gave me tawfiq, that is something, it only happens when the action starts. So when the action starts, that's where that tawfiq comes about. But the other tawfiq, that's always there. So that's where he differentiates. One happens exactly at the moment. So let me read that part. It occurs with that action. So the special tawfiq that comes from Allah, that happens exactly at that moment. But the ability that refers to health, capacity, readiness, and sound limbs, however, precedes the action. It happens before that. So we believe in all of the above. We also believe that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his chosen servant, his selected prophet, his messenger, that won his good pleasure. He is the seal of all prophets, the leader of the pious, the master of all messengers, and the beloved of the Lord of all the worlds. And SubhanAllah, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so like, beautiful with regards to the way he would remember other prophets. So if he, were, if he saw a situation, once he was troubled a lot so he mentioned uh, may Allah have mercy on Musa salam, for verily he was inconvenienced a lot mm. then when it came to Yusuf salam, how he was told you can come out of the jail and he said mm. no can you go find out was I the one that was intending to do something sinful or was it that lady that was thinking of doing something sinful mm -hmm. I want to know that before I come out of jail and the Bishop was so humble he said if I was Yusuf salam, I would have left the jail before I even get that clarified because as a human, you're in jail, you're feeling restricted. So mm -hmm. I would go for the for the ease. But he wanted to basically give virtue where it's due and remind us of how special every prophet is. And that's why uh, the Quran mentions, وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الْحُوتِ Do not rush like Yunus alayhi salam. But does that mean Yunus alayhi salam does not have a high rank? So no, there's another hadith that specifically mentions لَا تُفَضِّلُونِ Ala Yunus bin Matta, how come I call that? Do not say I'm better than Yunus alayhi salam even. So it just shows an extreme level of respect for the prophets. The, that is, it, is for Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam? Which one? La takun? Uh, for Yunus alayhi salam. Which one? Do not say that I'm better than Yunus alayhi salam. Oh, yeah. Nabi oh. salam specifically said that in a hadith. Okay. Okay. He specifically said, do not say I'm better than Yunus alayhi salam. Oh, okay, okay. okay. And the ayat says, do not be like Yunus alayhi salam who rushed. Mm -hmm. So Nabi Sam is being told, don't rush. Oh, okay. But it doesn't mean Yunus alayhi salam was doing anything. Mm -hmm. So otherwise his nation is one of the most unique nations. Because the Quran mentions there was no uh, nation ever that was saved after they had seen the punishment coming. Mm -hmm. Except Qawma Yunus. Mm -hmm. On Yunus alayhi nation, they saw the punishment coming. And that's when they suddenly went to Tawbah and Allah mm -hmm. forgave them. So mm -hmm. very unique. And uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is trying to relate to Musa alayhi salam. Uh, so Musa alayhi salam's relationship <coughs> like to us is really high level. And that's why in Mi'raj when Quran when Salat was being made to five Salats, it was Musa alayhi salam kept saying, go back, go back, go back. Mm -hmm. And it just shows you how much love he had for the Ummah. So that's that, and that's why in Zul Hijjah, it's sort of like remembering mm -hmm. Ibrahim alayhi salam because of the Hajj. But now in Muharram, we're remembering Musa alayhi salam. So two, mm -hmm. two months in a row mm -hmm. of the two of the greatest prophets. Mm -hmm. And that's why in Surah A'la, we mention Suhuf Ibrahima or Musa. <coughs> so two, those are two of the <coughs> highest ranking prophets. And they both have very unique and different lifestyles and they both give us a lot of lessons. So mm -hmm. whenever you're looking for <coughs> inspiration, think of all the prophets and likewise Ibrahim alayhi salam <coughs> and Musa alayhi salam and see how much we can take from their lives. May Allah give us a feet to understand and may Allah give us a feet to practice. Jazakumullah khair.